Hello everyone. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for today's sermon from Praise Assembly of God here at 89 Congress Street. Hope you enjoy this message and if you have any feedback you'd like to offer feel free to give me a call at 207-364-3856 or my cell phone 207-357-4748. Again, enjoy today's message. Thanks. A righteous king during the divided years after King Solomon's reign. This is a story of one who, even as a boy, by, Ju uh, by Israel's culture, because when a, when a boy or girl reached adolescence, when a girl could uh, have children, and when a guy reached adolescence, they became men and they became women. Here at eight years old was even below that age. But this is a boy who came to power and who led righteously the nation of Judah for almost 32 years. And this is a guy who came in and the first thing that he did was clean out God's house. Because it was filled with Baal worship, it was filled with idolatry, it was a mess. And this eight-year-old king would come to power and he would, he would just clean house. Not only in the temple, but in the communities, in the nation of Judah. And he, he raised his family to be God-fearing. He followed the example of King David. I mean, he did everything right. He actually dies at the age of 40 years old in battle. And he, did, like some generals and kings, they, he didn't fight from a distance. He fought right in the front lines with his troops. And that's where he died at 40 years old. But we're going to talk about a man today that is just so... Uh, so amazing to me because he led even as a child. Last night at prayer meeting, we talked about this, and we, we talked about uh, this story and how important this is to where even with children, sometimes we set the bar too low. Sometimes we don't think children are no good. You've probably heard it. Children are meant to be seen and not heard. Well, that's not what God thought. God allowed this boy to reign as a righteous king for almost 32 years. You know, and this is a guy that, you know, uh, just impresses me. And it must have impressed the Leclerc's as well. Because their oldest son is named Josiah. Amen. King Josiah is someone that just, just blows me away. Because it's like, this is so out of, out of the ordinary. This is something that we would think is, is like a... Like Doogie Hauser or something, you know, where this kid just is so advanced about, you know, about his years or whatever. But this is somebody that we're going to talk about today. And remember, as we're talking about, this is what we would call a boy. So this also tells me that King Josiah, he knew. He knew right from wrong. He knew what pleased God and what did not. He knew that the Hebrew people or the Israelite people in Judah during the divided kingdom years was bringing great displeasure to God, not only in their homes, but in the temple. And the first thing he did was clean house and restored worship that would be pleasing to the Lord. I ask you the question today, are you ready to clean house? Are you ready to for God's word from 2 Kings 23. Most people, when you hear that, what does that talk about? I don't know, Elijah, he's in there somewhere. But most people don't know about the book of 1 and 2 Kings. And are you ready to clean house to where you want to be true worshipers of the Lord, not only in God's house, but in your own house, at school, in the community, in church? Because this is what's happening. Uh, this, is, this is what's happening more and more. This is what I see, and our young people are confirming it because they come back and they say, Pastor, there just seems to be a double standard. I don't understand. I'm confused. Or it just seems like when we get behind the secluded walls of Facebook where our true colors just start to fly, and I'm thinking, how is that worship to the Lord? You know, and, and that means there could very well be a double standard to where worship is here one way, and out there, another way. Well, that's what was going on in Judah during Josiah's time. And, it, and then what happens is, church, this is the bottom line. With what you do at home, what you do at work, you're going to bring in here. It's eventually going to come. You know, and that's what impressed me about the, the video in Cuba, where there was life to the worship. There was, there was life from the front row to the back row, to the left, to the right. There was life. There was something amazing. These folks had labored to get into the house of God to worship the wonderful name of Jesus. Do you know what, what happens to us? 
if we get a little snafu in the morning or if we have one little obstacle, our worship goes right down the drain. You don't believe me? Come hang out with me. Last night at prayer meeting, my phone is ringing off the hook with four different things going on. One, and one did ask me, and I told you they would. Pastor, I was trying to get a hold of you. Where were you? Well, where have I been the last eight years on Saturday night? Right here. And what did I do? I just brought my phone right here and I, because it was just ringing. I said, Lord, take care of it. Right. That's what I did last night. So I could pray. I mean, this is, but our worship goes, and one little thing, and our worship goes, and this is what was going on. Church, this is what was going on with Josiah. And an eight-year-old understood that. An eight-year-old grasped it. An eight-year-old said, you know, uh, we've got to do something about this. We've got to do something. Because the first thing that will go, when a little adversity comes your way, or worship, which is a lifestyle, is not a conviction for you, it'll go bye-bye. I'll try again next week. I'll try again in 24 hours. And just go further and further away. Church, not only is this a house of prayer, but our name is Praise Assembly of God. But if our worship is not sincere, we will, we will, we will just simply fade away. The thing lastly in the intro before we get into 2 Kings is that Josiah, after he died, he had some sons. And the Bible says in Jeremiah that Josiah raised them in a God-fearing fashion. And his sons, his two sons, lived wickedly, forgot all about what they were, how they were raised, and what they learned. And Jeremiah tells us that they went further away from God than what it was when Josiah took office, if you will, at the age of eight years old. So what does that tell me? That tells me that if a child can understand what to do, but if that person, well, no matter what their age is, doesn't develop worship as a conviction of their life, I don't care how many services you come in here. I don't care if we sing a hymn, a new song, a song that somebody wrote. I don't care if it, it feels good, whatever, whatever the, the tempo is, all that kind of stuff. It's not going to impact our heart. It's not going to impact life being changed in this River Valley community and our worship will be dead because we ourselves are spiritually dead. Nothing different than the church at Sardis who was dead. Ask yourself the question, are you ready to clean house tonight to where your life behind the scenes publicly and privately is ready to please God? When it comes to, you know, the I'm not talking about music, church. I'm not talking about music now. I'm not talking about you know, hey, Pastor, I, I turn on my casting crowns. I turn on my Bill Gaither. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a lifestyle that's bringing worship to the Lord without a competition going on. Because that's what was happening as an eight-year-old boy. He saw this. He saw people on the Sabbath who wanted to come into church and honor the Lord's day. But he saw them coming in, bringing complete mockery to God's house and complete sorcery and idolatry such as worship to Baal and burning incense to Baal and all this going on in God's house. That's, that kind of thing, is, is that's a lifestyle. That is a choice. And I, I pray that we'll say, you know what, I'm ready to clean house. I'm ready to, I'm ready to be like Josiah. I'm ready to come in and just take care of business. You say, Pastor, well, that's Josiah. He's the king. Remember, he's an eight-year-old at this time. That's not going to be an easy thing for him to do unless God's behind him. And sure enough, God was behind him. But you know what? He, you may not be a king, but you do have a place to hang your head when you go home. You do have a place. You do have a place to be in control of, which is your body, which God has entrusted you to be a steward of his temple. You do have something that you have control over. Yep, you can't control your child or your neighbor. But you can certainly control whether or not your life is filled with worship that's pleasing unto the Lord. You don't have to be a king or a president. You don't have to be a governor or a pastor or a ministry team member. You do have responsibility over your life. And so I ask you again the question, are you ready to clean house? If you guys would be so kind as to stand with me for the reading of God's word. 2 Kings, which is toward the front of the Bible. 2 Kings 23. 23. 2 Kings 23. And we're going to be reading the first nine verses of Scripture. 
2 Kings chapter 23, verses 1 to 9, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. Now the king sent to him, Gather all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem to him. The king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah, and with him all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets, and all the people, both small and great, and he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant which had been around in the house of the Lord, been found in the house of the Lord. Then the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people took a stand for the covenant. And the king commanded Hekiah, the high priest, the priest of the second order of the doorkeepers, to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the articles that were made for Baal, Asherah for all the host of heaven, and he burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of Kildron, and carried their ashes to Bethel. Then he removed the idolatrous priest whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense on the high places of the cities of Judah and in the places all around Jerusalem and those who burned incense to Baal, to the sun, to the moon, to the constellations and to all the host of heaven. And he brought out the wooden image from the house of the Lord to the brook Kidron outside Jerusalem, burned it to the brook, at the brook Kidron and, and ground it to ashes and threw its ashes on the graves of the common people. Then he tore down the ritual booths of the perverted persons that were in the house of the Lord, where the women wove hangings for, for the wooden image. And he brought all the priests from the cities of Judah and defiled the high places where the priests had burned incense from Giba, from Giba to Bresheba. And also he broke down the high places at the gates, which were at the entrance of the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city, which were to the left of the city gate. Nevertheless, the priests of the high places did not come up to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem, but they ate unleavened bread among their brethren. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Well, here comes young Josiah. In America, we call it the president's first 100 days. Kind of is where's the big change going to be with how the office of the presidency is going to be run. Well, here comes Josiah as a very young king. And the first place he wants to fix is the house of God. Do you know, church, that your, the Bible says that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? As, as Pastor Dennis shared last Saturday afternoon, that the church really isn't the building. It is the people. Amen. And we take Jesus wherever we go. Amen. That means we take worship wherever we go. Amen. Now, Josiah, he's going to tackle the structure, the temple. But then as he brought all the peoples together of Judah for one reason, so that they would understand the covenants that David followed or the law of Moses, the righteousness, the Ten Commandments of God, and that there would be holiness centered around the people of Judah. And, and this is important for us to understand because this is what I think a lot of people here at Praise Assembly believe. Okay, and that is this. Well, at church you act one way, but at home you act another. Well, what you have done is not, you have not defined holiness, you have defined hypocrisy. <laughs> and, and church, I tell you what, your children, your young people, Children upstairs, young people that are down here, sometimes they have a good point. And, when, and it's important that we look at that and say, you know what? I love the Lord wherever I go. My body is a temple of the Holy Spirit wherever I go. And here, Josiah, he's going to bring that message. And we're going to break these, these first nine verses down of what, of what Josiah had to, had to deal with. And how Josiah, as... As the, as the king of Israel, but he understood. Now remember, he's a very young king. That he, that, that, that he is putting action, God's plan into action. He's going to hold accountable everybody that's involved. From the high priest to the governors to the people themselves. And church, if we want a clean house, we've got to say, you know what? I've got a, I've got a part in this. I've got, to, I've got to make sure that my worship, my life is pleasing unto the Lord. 
Church, God has something great for all of you to do to fulfill his plan in these last days. Every one of us have a part in that. But church, if we want to be used to our full potential, we have to have a clean vessel. We have to have a house that's clean before the Lord. And that it, and nobody's perfect, but then you've heard me preach on that. You know, we go to the foot of the cross, He forgives us, you know, His grace, His mercy. But when we have a desire just to live for God, we've got to say, you know what? I desire to have a consistent worship in my life. And I'm not going to let anything, I'm not going to let no trauma, no unforeseen issue, I'm not going to let anything affect my worship to the Lord. Because guess what? God wants you to worship whether you're down in a low valley, way down here where it's tough, where the element of surprise, the brokenness, you know, all that stuff that goes on when things don't go our way, when we have a little fender bender or when we... The, the car costs more money to repair than we thought or whatever the case may be, you know, or, or we have a tragedy. God, God says, you know what? I still want you to worship me down in this valley low. I want you to praise the wonderful name of Jesus down here. Or, and, or if you're in the middle, if you're climbing up the mountain, you know what? I want, I, want to, I want to see you worship me. Or if you're in a good place where life's going good, you got a nice house, your kids are all healthy and everything's going good, you know, and God wants you to worship him up in the mountaintop as well. Well, church, let me backtrack again to 2,600 years ago. That's not what was going on in Josiah's life. And his reign, as he becomes king, he's going to see that the priests are, are corrupt, the people are corrupt, and they eventually bring their corruptness, they bring their lack of genuine worship through the week, they bring it into God's house on the Sabbath day. Church, do you know if you're not careful, you can bring the devil right in here with you. How did the devil get in here? Because you brought him in here. If you've been hanging out with with uh, reading, a, hanging out somewhere, reading a book, or watching a movie, we're going into Halloween, going to be preaching on this. If you're filling your mind with all this sorcery, you know what? You're going to bring that up in here. You know, or if, if you come here and you've been, you know, uh, talking like a drunken sailor all week, you're, been, you're going to start bringing that up in here. Next thing you know, Pastor, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that. Because you're starting to swear. It doesn't matter. Or if you bring in that, that, that spirit of doubt, or that, that, that spirit of, of condemnation, you're going to bring that up in here. And if you don't deal with it, it affects your worship. It causes you to be a stumbling block. It brings your neighbor down. It's, it's written all over your face. I want to see people who love Jesus and who love to worship Him and praise Him. And you know what? If you're going through a hard time, there's a place here at this altar. There's a place where we can pray for you and that you can be, you know, say, you know what, Lord? I'm worshiping you anyway because I love you. Amen. Think about that in that Cuba video. A professional's making $20 a month. That's American money. 20 bucks. That's... That's, think about think about if you lived off of 20 bucks. You say, well, Pastor, that's down in Cuba. Yeah, but 20 bucks still isn't much money. I don't care where you live. And those people giving cheerfully, sacrificially, worshiping the Lord, standing for hours on the end, you know, coming into God's house. I mean, that to me is just amazing. Their worship was genuine. The worship was real. And here, Josiah, he didn't have that in America. What? What do we have in America? You know, we, we have most churches... Like here, our capacity is 250. We're nowhere near that. You know, most a lot of churches are closing. Some churches, you know, are, are going through hard times. They're not sure how they're going to make the winter. In Maine, we in Maine we just go through seasons of when we're going to worship God together as a taste of heaven. We've now left vacation season. Guess what? It's football season. Or fair season. The fair starts today. Can't be a church pastor going to the fair. Well, what's next week? Well, it's the last day of the fair. What's the following week? Well, football. I mean, then it just goes into holiday mode. Then it goes into cold weather mode. And, and then you just circle around. When is it convenient to worship God? When is it convenient to worship Him in our home? When is it convenient to worship Him as the taste of heaven? Verse number 1 of 2 Kings 23 writes, Now the king sent to them to gather all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem to him. So King Josiah, young King Josiah, he says to his servants, go out and gather all the elders of Judah and of Jerusalem and bring them to him. Elders have influence. Josiah is going to hold those that have influence together. I tell the ministry team here all the time, 
If we are not going deeper in Christ, we cannot expect the congregation to go deeper in Christ. If our worship is dry, expect the worship of someone else's uh, a work, someone else's life to be dry. If our if our lives are filled with hypocrisy, how can we expect anyone else to seek after righteousness? It's the same type of peace. He's going to hold accountable. You know, this is this is great wisdom. This is God speaking through a boy who is the king of Judah, the southern kingdom. You know, to lead his people, and he sent for the elders and of Judah and Jerusalem. Verse number two, the king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah and with all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets, and all the people, both small and great. Josiah wanted them all. Small, great, it didn't matter. He wanted every person because Josiah knew that every person had influence when it came to worship of the Lord in God's house. Guess what? That means all of us here. There's not one person in here greater than another. We're all eating. We all put our pants on one leg at a time. We all fall short of the glory of God. Everyone in here is equal in the eyes of God. And God desires the worship of every person here. You say, Pastor, I can't sing. Well, remember, worship is not all about just singing. Worship is a lifestyle. Worship is what we do privately and publicly, professionally. Worship is what we do. It's our life. Josiah, he wanted everybody to be gathered. He wanted the elders. He wanted the people. He wanted the religious leaders. He wanted the inhabitants of both great and small. He wanted them all. You know what this sounds like to me? A Sunday morning at Praise Assembly. Why is this so, for sake of the fellowship, why is this so important? Because this is where believers across the river valley come in to worship the Lord, and we are all equal. We are all on the same playing field. When you go home, some of you will go home to an apartment. Some of you will go home to a big house. Some of you will walk to home today. Some of you will step in a $40,000 car. You know, we all, some of us, you know, have different, uh, different uh, luxuries and different things of that sort. But what brings us together here is Jesus Christ. That's why Sunday is so important. Because you're come, this is a taste of heaven. We don't, we don't stop you at the door and ask you for a ticket. We don't stop you at the door and say, hey, you need this amount or that amount. Or why are you dressed like this? Or why are you dressed like that? You know, we don't, we don't do that. You know, this is, this is important here. J Josiah, he's bringing everybody together. Great and small. Continuing on verse 2. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the house of the Lord. The book of the covenant comes from Deuteronomy. It comes from the Mosaic law that God gave through Moses to the people. And it was found in the house of the Lord. It would be like church us. If we, you know, some churches have given up to, given into yoga and all these other things going on in, in their place, you know. Uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. That would be like us having this nice big Bible on the altar and never opening it. And it had a bunch of dust on it. You know, have you ever been to a church service and never even read from the Bible? I've done that. I've had not done that, but I've been there. Read someone else's opinion or someone else's book, the latest big thing. But that would be like us coming in here and having the truth of God's word right here, but leaving it closed. Well, Josiah is going to take what's already in the house of the Lord, which is the book of the, book of the covenant, or the book in this case of Deuteronomy, and the teachings and the law of God that centered around holiness and righteousness. And he's going to start reading it to them so that they understand, guess what? There's a new sheriff in town. There's a new king that's going to have a different opinion than my predecessors. There's something different. And we're going to get back to the basics of life, the righteousness and holiness of God. And he starts in the words of the book of the covenant, which has been found in the house of the Lord. So everything he was reading should be what is the centerpiece of what's going on in God's house, the word of God. But it had been closed for a long period of time. I ask you this question, how often do you open your Bible in your own house? You know full well when you come in here, you're going to get God's word. You know full well that's going to be the case. Whether you come here for prayer, you're going to get a devotion. You come in here for a Bible study, it's going to be God's word. You come in here for a sermon, you're getting God's word. Okay, but how often, as a worship unto the Lord, do you bring this out in your home? Young people, let me ask you. 
How often do you open up God's Word without being told? I don't care if it's on your phone or if it's in your hand. How often do you do it? Well, I don't have to. Dad told me I only have to do it, you know, blah, blah, blah. Guess what? That's an attitude of I really don't want to. Young people, showtime. Adults, showtime. Seniors, showtime. And as I've said before, you know what? If you can't read or you have trouble reading, guess what? Just go to Bible Gateway and let the Bible, let the computer read to you. If you don't have a computer, come see me and we got a couple of Bible on DVD or CDs and you can just listen to it that way. So if you have a desire to worship God through His Word, it's available to you. Here, Josiah, I love a church in it. And this is just a boy. This is just a very young king. This is just one who's, who realizes that there's great displeasure taking place. And he's cleaning house. And he's doing it by God's word being the centerpiece. Verse number 3, Then the king stood by, the, by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes. So he calls people together. This sounds like King Solomon when he became king. After David had died, well, actually, David didn't die. He, he, he uh, lived for a little bit of time. And then before uh, Solomon, he took, Solomon took the throne a few days before David died. But made a covenant before the Lord and said, we are going to live by the statutes of God. We are going to live by the word of God. You know what? If you want to do that, then go home today and say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Husbands and fathers in here, bring your wife and kids together if you haven't already. And say, you know what? From now on, we're going to make a covenant before God to follow His statutes. Wow. Who's willing to do that? Who's willing to clean house? How many people here when your parents told you to clean your room, you shoved it in the closet or under the bed. How many people still shove it under the closet or under the bed? <laughs> Let me tell you, if you're not willing to do that, then you're not willing to clean house. If you're not willing to say, you know what, Lord, I'm making a covenant with you today. I'm making a promise with you today. I'm going to worship you by following your statutes and by following your word. Later on, Jesus would say in the gospel, if you're not willing to do that, you're not willing to be his disciple. Jesus gets pretty serious about Josiah. Matter of fact, talks about Josiah and his righteousness as a, as a king. All right, And cleaning house is not going to be easy. A lot of you probably dread cleaning house. Spring cleaning, you, you dread that. You dread cleaning the bathroom. Some of you just go ahead and pay somebody to come in and do it so you don't have to. You know, and it's, and it's, and it's difficult. I'm not going to tell you here today that this message is going to be easy. But I am here today to tell you that if you don't start to clean your house, it's affecting your walk with God. It's affecting the worship in this place. It's sending a mixed message be of what people see in your life, both, both on uh, the computer as well as live and in color. I mean, it's affecting, just like Josiah, it affected people. And then Christians ask the question, Pastor, is it okay to participate in yoga? Is it okay to read my horoscope? Is it okay to look at the stars and count the stars? No, you don't need to count the stars and make a decision. Why don't you seek the one who created the stars? Yeah. Christians do this stuff all the time. All the time. If I was to say, Brandon, click over to my Facebook and start scrolling down, some of you might start to wiggle in your seat. You know? That's, that's not, that sends a complete different message. Say, Pastor, well, it sounds like you're judging me. I'm not judging you. I'm just telling you what true worship is. Amen. I'm just telling you what God expects. I'm telling you what a boy expected from the people of Judah. Because, it, because that what went on during the week was brought into the house of God. And it was deemed okay. It was deemed okay. And if, and if Josiah, as a righteous young king, can see this, why in the world can we not as teenagers and adults see this? Well, if we're lovers of money, if we're lovers of the world, if we're laying up our treasures on earthly things and not heavenly things, we're going to say, you know what, are you ready to clean house? No, I am not. And go on. But let me tell you, if you do, it's going to affect your worship. You're going to wonder, where is God in my life? You're going to wonder, why isn't he answering my prayer? You're going to wonder, why does everything seem to be falling apart? You know, and that worship is, that worship, that, that, that faith, over doubt is so important to us. Now again, nobody's perfect and praise God for His grace and His mercy and He restores us and He forgives us. But that doesn't mean we just keep 
repeating the cycle over and over and over again. And that's what was going on in Israel until there was a new sheriff in town, a very young sheriff who is restoring true worship to the people of Judah. Unfortunately, once he was dead at the age of 40, true worship went back down the drain and people re returned to their way of life. And of course, as we learn today, Israel would stay in bondage for 2,800 years. Verse number, verse number um, uh, four. I'm sorry, continue on verse number three. With all his heart and with all his soul to perform the words of the covenant that were written in this book and all the people took a stand for the covenant. Sounds like when Jesus said, love me with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, doesn't it? Jesus was great at, at following up his servants. But when you think about this, they all took the covenant. They all said to the question, are you ready to clean house? They all said yes, and they took a covenant. And they were ready to live righteously. They were ready to live a changed life. They, they took the covenant with King Josiah. But as soon as he was gone, down the drain, things went. Yesterday, uh, one of my uh, greatest mentors, Pastor Kugel, you may have read it in today's paper, but yesterday there was a 45-year celebration. That brother's been pastor of that church since 1970 down in Lewiston. He started at 23 years old. And it just blessed me reading the article because here's my mentor. Here's the one that helped me so much the first four years we were in Maine. Okay, and as, and as I'm reading this, I'm thinking, wow, uh, you know, praise, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for a mentor like this. But I began to ask myself the question, what's going to happen to that church when he's gone? And him and I have talked about it before where there's so many people that have such a deep respect for him, but that respect he's unsure is going to be carried over when he retires. You know, church, if we have a conviction to be a true worshiper of God, it don't matter who the pastor is, it don't matter who's up here preaching. What matters is what we believe. And as soon as Josiah was gone, but they all stood and took the covenant. They all stood and took the covenant to say, we're going to live a life that's righteous and holy. But how things can change. How things can change very quickly. But Josiah said there, with all my heart and soul, I'm going to follow his commandments. His statutes. And I want you to follow them as well. Verse number four. And the king commanded Hekiah, the high priest of the second order, and the doorkeepers to bring out, to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the articles that were made to Baal and Asherah and all and for all the host of heaven. And he burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of Kildon and buried and carried their ashes to Bethel. And that was like a cemetery place. He took it all. He cleaned out and said, I want everything in here that's unrighteous out of here. Go on, get it out. Don't want anything to bail. Just, just start a cleaning house. You know what? I encourage you to go home and do the same. Go home and do the same. Go home and take an inventory. If you say, yes, Lord, I want, I want to be a true worshiper, guess what? Then you've got to start making some tough decisions. Here, Josiah knew that if, that if he didn't clean out the house of the Lord, that those folks were just going to continue to follow. There was going to be no, no blessing of God upon them. There was, not, there was not going to be any possibility of serving two masters. He cleaned house. And, he, and he, calls for the, he calls for the orderlies. He calls for the doorkeepers. Clean house and he burned them in a cemetery. He burned them to get rid of them. Just two weeks ago I had the wonderful privilege. Someone said, Pastor, this stuff's got to go. We went in with big, 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 big black bags. And we, you know what, we did not... You know, we're not, we're not taking them to the whatnot shop. Forget that. We are getting rid of this. Amen. It's, it's not going to harm no one else ever again. Amen. Clean house. Church, that's what we need to do. Why? Because it's affecting our worship. It's affecting this family of God. It's sending mixed messages to our kids and young people. You know, let's be real. Let's be real in who we are. Church, I stand behind this pulpit proud to say, you know what, I'm a believer of Jesus Christ. I love His Word. It's important. I am persuaded, as Paul writes. Verse number, uh, verse number six, I'm sorry, verse number five. 
Then he removed the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense on the high places of the cities of Judah and in the places all around Jerusalem. And so he's removing priests. Anybody that's represented to Baal has to go. Anybody, I mean, that's the, he's cleaning house, church. A kid that cleans house. That'd be a good sermon title. <laughs> Parents, would you like it if your kids cleaned house? Swept the floor, did the laundry, didn't have to ask him, didn't have to bribe him. Here is, here is Josiah. He's cleaning house. This, this idolatry, this idolatry has to go. I mean, he's, he's taking care of business. He, anything, anything offered incense to Baal has to go. Then he goes on to say, to the sun, to the moon, to the constellations, and to all the host of heaven. Anybody that's up there that's counting stars and all this other stuff, it's got to go. He's cleaning. I mean, it's, 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 it's not happening. You know, we're learning in world history class for the school here, for the middle school is learning. We just had a test, matter of fact, on Friday. I wonder how anybody will do. We'll see. But you know what? what uh, what's that, brother? You're confident you didn't fail. Man, you got to be confident over there, Isaac. But we just learned about Egypt. And before that, we learned about Mesopotamia. Okay, and we learned about the Tower of Babel. And we learned about how all these cultures were going in different directions and how some of them worshipped the sun god and the moon god and the constellations and all this other stuff that, that was filled with them. Rather than worshipping God himself, the creator of all these things, they're specifically worshipping, you know, things that God had made. For example, the moon and the stars and the sun. Well, church, God is not happy with that, nor was Josiah. Here, Josiah gets rid, gets rid of all of it and burns it. If you can't wait for the new Star magazine to come out every week to read your horoscope or the Sun Journal, you need to go home and burn that. That's not, that's not pleasing to the Lord. That's putting your faith in something other than Him. And you better believe that's going to affect your worship. How can you sing a song about heaven and you know, you've been sitting there making decisions based on what your, your, your horoscope says? You know, how, how that's going to affect your worship, and it all had to go. Verse number 6, And he brought out a wooden image from the house of the Lord to the, book of, the brook of Kildron, outside Jerusalem, burned it at the brook of Kildron, and, and ground it to ashes, and threw its ashes on the graves of the common people. He burned everything, and he passed it on. It was not going to be any possibility that that stuff was going to survive. He's cleaning house. Now you say, Pastor, why did he burn, throw the grave on the graves of the, of, the, of the common people? Because I would argue and believe that a lot of people that were in those graves were there prematurely because of their worship. I believe there are a lot of people, if you continue reading about Josiah and what he believed and, and that the way we live catches up to us. And there were a lot of people out in those graves prematurely. And that was just symbolic. Those ashes were just symbolic of what put them in their grave. Worship is so important to us, church. It can, it can affect us in so many ways. And he threw them on the graves of the common people. Verse 7, then he tore down the ritual booths of the perverted persons that were in the house of the Lord where the woman wove hangings for wooden images. He's, he's tearing down perversion. He's tearing down rituals. He's tearing down things that displease the Lord. I mean, when you come in here, guys, we want everything in this house to be pleasing unto the Lord. We don't want anything that's not pleasing to God. Not a piece of literature, not a chair, you know, not anything that's going to displease God. This is His house, but you know what? It should be that same attitude about our own houses. We have to make that decision. So, you know, I don't want anything in here because it will affect your worship, your lifestyle. And I tell you what, this message is for praise assembly of God. This isn't, a, this isn't a, the church going down the drain in America. This is a message for us. Last night here at prayer meeting, Lord, you know, this is some serious verses. Lord laid on my heart, but you'll find out who wants to clean house. You'll find out who loves me with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. You'll find out who's real. You may very well find out who has the faith to endure even mild persecution for the sake of the cross. Rather than just remaining silent and looking the other way. 
You'll find out who wants to go deeper in Christ and deeper in their worship. More than just singing. I'm talking about the decisions of life. I'm talking about how we, how we raise our children. How we impact and mentor other children. That wholesome attitude. Josiah didn't want no part of the ritual booths that were there. No part of the perversions that were in the house of the Lord. Think about it. This was all going on. You know, in God's house, but wherever you go, remember you're a temple of the Holy Spirit. These kinds of things going on in, in your house. Think about it. If you go with the, the, the Halloween movies will be coming out or, or coming out on Netflix, guess what? If you pay for them, you fall into the perversion of the evil of this world. And it's going to affect your worship. Say, Pastor, how do you know? Because let's say you, and we all know going to the movies is kind of expensive. Let's just say, for argument's sake, $8 a ticket, and you have a family of five. Math students, eight times five is... And then you decide when you get there that, you know what, we need popcorn, and we need, you know, we need X, Y, and Z. So that $40 becomes 80 And it's a Saturday night. And you come rolling up in church, and you're exhausted, and you go to your wallet, and you find your tithe money has now been spent on Friday the 13th or Freddy Krueger or whatever's out there today. And that money is no longer there, and you have taken your tithe money for that. You mean to tell me that hasn't affected your worship? Oh. It affects it. Church, it's, it all, it's a, it's a circle. It's a vicious circle. Not cycle, but circle. And this is what happens. And it brings down our worship. And I think it's time we're ready to clean house and praise assembly. We're ready to take an inventory. Put yourself in my shoes. Phone's ringing. Issue. Bat signal goes out. You deal with this. Okay? Why, why can't you, why can't, you know, what's going on, what's happening? Well, I, I watched this, I read that, and now I don't feel close to God. My question back to them is, you mean to tell me you were going to get close to God by reading this stuff? You mean to tell me you're going to get close to God by robbing God? You mean to tell me you're going to get close to God by letting the meditations of your heart think on something that is, is, is evil? No, but I was just looking to have a good time, and God told me it was okay. No, God didn't tell you it was okay. God's never going to tell you to contradict his own word and say it's okay. I heard that yesterday, and I thought I was going to come through the phone. God told me it was okay. No, God didn't tell you that. God did not tell you that. It was your flesh who wanted to do it, and you indulged in it. So step up and take responsibility. God's not going to tell you to violate his word. And here Josiah, he saw, he saw these booths. He saw the perversion that was in the people, that was in the house of the Lord. And, and all these wooden images that the women were making. So everybody was taking part in it. And it all displeased God. Anything in your house that displeases God? Your spiritual house. Could be in your car. You know, it could be out in your boat. You know, maybe it could be, you know, downstairs in your cellar somewhere. Where you just don't think God sees it. Guess what? God sees it and affects your worship. Verse number 8, we're almost finished here today. Verse number 8, and he brought all the priests from the cities of Judah and defiled the high priest where the priests had burned incense. So Josiah, he goes now, not only in, in Jerusalem, but he says, bring me all the priests. I, I would argue, church, that the reason so many pastors are struggling today is because they've forgotten what true worship is. A lot of our pastors struggling with adultery, struggling with gambling, pornography, things that are going on, and it's no wonder churches are dead today. No wonder, you know, we, we have the problems that we do. We have the hypocrisy that's going on in church to church to church. Because as Josiah had to deal with, there were priests who were participating in the unrighteousness who needed to clean their house but would not. Well, now he's coming in and he's bringing them all together. Brings them all together. From all the cities of Judah. Remember Judah is the southern kingdom. Jerusalem is the capital city. Okay. Brings them all together. That defiled the places where the priests had burned incense. 
from Giba to Bathsheba, and he broke down the high places at the gates which were at the entrance of the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city, which were to the left of the city gate. So the place that Joshua had built, remember it was Joshua that led the Hebrews to the promised land, and now had been replaced because of priests and their actions with idolatry. And, 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 and Josiah is bringing all this down. Josiah is saying, enough. And he brought all the priests that did this, and he's going to hold them accountable. Guess what? You're going to be held accountable too, just like I'm going to be held accountable. I don't want anything to keep me from worshiping the Lord. And I'll be honest with you today, as I was worshiping God over there singing about heaven, I had to pray, Lord, may I not get so uh, frustrated dealing with situation after situation that it impacts my ability to worship you. I don't want to become like Moses who called the Hebrew people stiff-necked. I, I, I want to be able to come in here and worship with you and lift up the name of Jesus with you. But this is what we have. Well, we're having a bad day, so we just stay home. That's when you need to be here. That's when you need to go before the Lord. You're, don't let Satan rob your worship. Don't let Satan rob you of that. You better believe, church, that, that, that he, you play right into his hand. Well, I'm just not in the mood to. Remember, worship is not about singing. It is a lifestyle. It is the condition of your heart. You know, it's, it's important that we grasp this here today. And lastly, verse 9, Nevertheless, the priests of the high places did not come up to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem. But they ate unleavened bread among their brethren. What are we going to do when we get found out? Just like Adam and Eve, we're going to hide. We're not going to heed the call. We're not going to make the covenant to follow the Lord in all His righteousness and all His statutes. We are going to run that way instead of this way. At our home, what's going to happen? Our Bibles are going to close. Our, our prayer closets are going to become dark. What's going to happen? Our, our attitude to, to love other people as Jesus loved them, to love thy neighbor as thyself, is not going to happen. What's going to happen when it comes time to bear and share one another's burdens? We're going to say, I don't care. I've got my own burdens to deal with. I can't help you. Now let me tell you something, church. That's real easy to think about. Real easy to, to think about, you know, when, when um, in my case... You know, family time. Uh, my parents have been up for two weeks. You know, and, and all the stuff that's going on. You know, and, and, and happening. It's like, I can't be a million places at once. We need to take what we've learned and apply it to our life as worship. And if that means sing our troubles away, our prayer troubles away, or get serious and say, Lord, just like a tree planted by the water, I shall not be moved and carry on rather than crumbling and falling apart and then get mad at me when you can't uh, get through. Amen. Amen. Well, church, let me just say, if our worship, if our worship, if we, if, if, if our worship is our life, if our worship is sincere, we're going to see something different happen. You know what that something different is called? A revival. Amen. A revival. A revival to, and, and, and I'm going to close with this. I'm going to close with this. One of the greatest things of worship that is unused for some reason, which I don't understand, is prayer. Because all those situations this past week, have you been praying about this, brother? What's God telling you? Have you sought the Lord in prayer? No. I called you first. Why not? Don't call to God and call me back. Prayer, church, is one of the greatest attributes that God's given us where we can just simply talk to God. If you continue following Josiah's life, like Daniel, he was a man of prayer. And again, a young king who understood prayer. 
Remember, Jesus said, let the children come. I believe children can understand prayer. I'm praying that Hannah will understand prayer. I pray that you will want your children to understand prayer. And not only understand it, but practice it. Amen. I mean, last night we circled up here at the front and we prayed through intercessory prayer for people who are going through storms. And let me tell you, I can tell who was at prayer meeting when they come in here. Because all that heaviness and all that's been brought before the Lord and they're ready to worship God. Amen. And I can also tell who's unprepared. I can also tell, I don't know about this, because you almost have to prime the pump just to be able to worship God. Prayer is huge. Prayer is, is unused. You know, prayer is, is, is almost a, the greatest gift next to the Bible, I believe, that God's given us to be able to talk directly to God. And it's not, it's not being used. Let's clean out our house and say, you know what? Prayer is the top priority in my life. That prayer closet is important. Everybody's talking about the war room. What's that about? Prayer! Do you think that's going to carry That's just going to be a feel-good movie. For a couple of weeks, if you don't develop a conviction to pray, that's all it's going to be. It's all it's going to be, church. And worship is huge. Without prayer, I don't believe you're going to have worship. Without talking to God. And that, that just like you, you're not going to have a good marriage if you don't communicate with your spouse. Amen. It's not happening. It's not the same thing with God. How can you worship God? One, if you don't know God. And two, how can you worship Him if you haven't been talking to Him? Amen. And here, here's, and we have a great movie out, War Room, wonderful movie. People seeing it left and right, great movie. But it's going to be nothing more than a feel good if you don't buy into the theme of that movie, which is a prayer room becomes a war room for what we're dealing with all around us. So last night I called the people, I said, we need to intercede because they don't have the faith or the strength or the confidence to seek God in prayer, not only at church, but in their own prayer closets because I'm asking people. I'm at, you praying about this, man? Are you, are you on your knees before God? Are you fasting? Your world's falling apart. Are you seeking God, the king of the universe, the king of the world? Are you seeking him? No. I started to, but it, it didn't get me anywhere. You mean to tell me you started to pray and didn't get anywhere? I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Because I can tell you, every time since I got saved, going before God, God starts answering. Now, he may, it may, I may have to labor for a little bit longer, but God will answer. He will be faithful. Jesus taught us that example. So pray, church. Pray. It's like, lastly, you know, when you clean your house, and sometimes you just have to hit one room first. You just got to hit the bedroom, the kitchen, the bathroom, whatever it is for you in your house. You know, you just got to hit one room. And sometimes the problem gets so bad, you just don't even worry about it. We've, we've cleaned people's houses where I just said, forget this, we're hiring a dumpster. Bring a dumpster, and we're just, we're just throwing nothing saved. We've done that three or four people in the last couple of years. Just bringing the dumpster right to the window and even everything. Maybe you need to clean house and, and just cut to, the, cut to the core of the issue. Some of you, you know what, I can clean this, I can clean that. But whatever that room is, start in the biggest priority. Don't, I, 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 I really believe that. Whatever room that is in your house, start with it. And let God do the rest. Mm -hmm. That's what Josiah did. He started with the elders. He started with God's house. Then he took it to a cemetery. Then he took it to the common people. Then he took it and he went right around. And he cleaned house. And he reigned righteously for 30 years. Two years. He died at the age of 40. I'll be 40 in a couple years. Couple years. <laughs> Alright? And when you think about it, he had died when we're just starting. And he had already been king for 32 years. That's a man of God. That's a man that God used righteously. Because he was willing to clean house. The question is now, are you? Father, thank you for your word here today from 2 Kings 23. Thank you for King Josiah, eight years old and becomes king. Lord, and he reigned righteously. And even as a little kid, Lord, he knew what was right and what is wrong. 
And Lord, I believe right now that every person in this room knows what is right and what is wrong. Lord, I... Hello. Thanks for watching today's message. Appreciate you taking the time to listen to each word of God as shared here today. I'd also like to take this time to invite you to our weekly services. Sunday school for all ages at 9 a.m. Worship at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. with Children's Church at 10 a.m. Also, we have a special men's and women's group at 5 p.m. on Sundays. During the week, we have several services as well. We have an extra innings class with me, Pastor Justin, on Tuesdays at 10. Uh, also, uh, Tuesday nights at 7 p.m., we have a special class on Israel and the Book of Acts. Wednesday, we have a love and respect class for married couples at 10 a.m. Also, on Wednesday night, we have our family night for all ages at 6.30 p.m. And lastly, we have our food pantry on Thursdays with servings at both 10 and 11 a.m. May God richly bless you today. Thanks again for watching.